sing out.
so weary when troubles come and my heart burden be then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I shine bright and it would be shining still but they all started turning on each other mm. you see the poets thought the dancers were shallow and the soldiers thought the poets were weak and the elders saw the young ones as foolish and the rich man never heard the poor man and one by one they ran away with their made-up minds to leave it all behind and the light began to fade in the city on the hill the city on the hill each one thought that they knew better but they were different by design Instead of standing strong together, they let their differences divide. And one by one, they ran away with their made-up minds to leave it all behind. And the light began to fade. 
Good evening, and God bless you. And I want to say welcome to those of you that are here at the First Southern Baptist Church in Duane Park, California. And I also want to say thank you to those of you joining us by Ustream.tv here in 
Southern California and literally around the world. We broadcast this week uh, from up in uh, Clovis, California, about 250 miles from here. I drove up there on Monday morning. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, but uh, it's good to be back. It's always good to go. It's good to be back. And thank you for that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I want us to honor uh, a lot of things. First of all, we want to always honor Jesus and the way we best honor Jesus. You know, I've said this before. Many people are always, they end a speech and they say, and God bless America. Well, that's cool. I'm glad to do that. However, I have adopted a new policy. When I make a speech or a prayer or whatever, I say, America, bless God. God has blessed America. We need to bless God. The best way we can bless God is by being obedient. I'm a grandfather. I'm a father. Was a husband. And the best way my wife and my children and my grandchildren could bless me they gave me some beautiful ties and stuff over the years for my birthday and Christmas and all kind of things. Gave me some other great gifts, you know. Um, I still get compliments on my ties that my girls gave me. And I used to, people used to look at my ties and go, well, yeah, that's a tie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then my girls sort of took on my tie uh, project and gets me in some pretty good ties. But anyway, I say all of that simply to say, uh, all the blessings they give me, the best blessing they give me is be obedient. Be obedient. To me and to their mother and to anybody else that they need to be obedient to their boss, you know, kind of thing. And so the Bible says the best way we can bless God, our Heavenly Father, is to be obedient. So I want to be obedient to something I committed us to a few years ago while I was in Washington, D.C. at an organization called the Family Research Council. And if you've not looked them up on the web, you ought to. They are the largest organization in America today that is fighting for the family. Their theme is, what is it? Faith, family, huh, I'm missing one. Anyway, I'll try to remember it later. But uh, they're a good group. They work in Washington, D.C., and uh, they started this project called Call the Fall. And they encouraged us to be a part of it. And Okay, we'll try that again. I'll try not to touch it. <laughs> anyway, um, I wanted to be obedient. I told them I was for it, that I would bring it back to my church, and of course we have, and there it is. So if you would, first of all, stand up and greet someone with a handshake, a hug, a hello, whatever you're, con whatever you're comfortable with, and um, say welcome and greet them. And then as soon as you get back to your seat area, God bless you, God bless you. Come back to your seat area. Stand up before you get on your knees. I know some of you are already down, but stand back up. Turn and look at the camera. And say hello. All right. All right. Now turn back around and join me on your knees. And repeat after me our obedience to the Lord, to faith, family, freedom. I knew I'd think of it. The uh, group in D.C. is the uh, Family Research Council, and their theme is Faith, Family, and Freedom. And they do a great, great work. And uh, that's the number. Okay, and we've got uh, 23 people here, if we've counted right. Joe had his shoes off, so I think he got it right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we've got 23 here tonight. Let's invite somebody else. Get some more people out. Let's, we need some more people here to pray with us, to commit. And let us now be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I committed you. Yes, I committed me. Yes, it's an organization. But most of all, it's to the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so let us 
be obedient and repeat after me. I will answer, I will answer. God's call to fall, call to fall. On, my knees, on my knees in humility, in humility. And, seek and seek his face in repentance. So that, he so that he might forgive, might forgive my, sins my sins and heal our land. Heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. amen, amen. All right, you may return back to your seats. And uh, we're going to pray. And we're going to share a little bit about... Uh, my trip, what it was all about, why I went, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm also going to share with you uh, some things that happened on the trip, good and bad. <laughs> Most of you have probably already heard I left here on Monday morning, rented a car. I didn't want to put, you know, three, four hundred miles on my car because it's sort of like me, you know, a little old. <laughs> and uh, Enterprise Car Rental is very generous to us. They give us the van to use once a month for their Hollywood prayer tour. And praise God for that. And um, they also give us a good deal. So if you ever need to rent a car, you go see them and tell them Pastor Drake sent you, and they will give you the best possible deal they can. So anyway, I, I decided it would be, for three or four days, it would be inexpensive to get a car from them. They didn't give it to me, but they gave it to me very cheap. So I rented a car, took off to Clovis, 255 miles from here. Traffic was great. Didn't have to leave till 11 in the morning. Traffic was great all the way up. When I got up there, it began to rain just a little bit. The streets were wet. First rain they had had in five or six months. And I don't know what happened. <laughs> all I know is I hit the back of a car. Uh, I don't know if it was because I wasn't paying attention. I did not have my cell phone on. <laughs> it was plugged in, off, laying in the seat. The police officer asked me that, too, by the way. Anyway, I'm driving along here, just minding my own business. All of a sudden, wham! Now, like I said, I don't know whether it was the traffic stopped due to some problem, and it, I couldn't stop, or I was not paying close enough attention. That's certainly possible at my age. <laughs> um, and knowing my makeup, it could have been possible that I wasn't paying attention. But all I know is wham. Before I'd left, I'd asked God to send angels to protect me, and I didn't see an angel in that car, but I did say thank you for airbags. Because when it hit hard, as it hit, the airbag exploded, as it's supposed to. <laughs> and uh, kept me from hitting the steering wheel. It was a small car. Kept me from hitting the steering wheel or the windshield, and I don't have a sore neck. I don't have a bruise. So God really watched over me and protected me. So say, thank you, Jesus, for taking care of our pastor. I said, say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you. I've already said that several times, and I said, Lord, now if I need to learn from this to be more uh, observant and to be more careful, I promise you, Lord, I'll do my best. And uh, so anyway, that was the beginning of my first day. Now, the reason I was going up there, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about who we are. Some of you are new to this church. Some of you are new to Southern Baptist life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Southern Baptist life and who we are and what we are and sort of how we work. I've been a Southern Baptist. That's a denomination of Baptists. There's all kind of Baptists. There's American Baptists and General Baptists and Dedicated Baptists and Foot Washing Baptists and all kind of Baptists and Baptists. But there's one group, the largest group of Baptists, is called the Southern Baptist Convention. That's the National Convention of Southern Baptists. I'll tell you a little bit more about us in a little bit, but right now let me just suffice it to say is we have about 50,000 churches. We are one of 50,000 churches in America. As big as we are, we're still very small. 
the average Southern Baptist church, we're below average, but the average Southern Baptist church is about 125 people. So they don't, not, about, not a lot of big churches. There are some big ones, Dallas and Fort Worth and Chicago, some big churches. The church we met at in Clovis, they run 1,400 on Sunday morning. So it's a big church and a big property, and that's why we met there, because they got a big building. <laughs> and because uh, we meet every year. But anyway, um, even though we are a large organization, we are very, very, I think, biblically correct in our independence. This church is a Southern Baptist church. It belongs to the association of Orange County Southern Baptist churches. We have about 40 churches in Orange County that have the name or the association with Southern Baptist churches. And you have probably heard me say that some of our people are a little bit, well, I'm not a Southerner, and, you know, we want to change the name. Well, I'm not going to change the name of this church, and uh, I'll fight anybody that wants to change the name of our convention, and they know that. But at any rate, um, I understand people not wanting to be associated with the South and, and uh, so on and so forth, and, and, uh, and because some of us Southerners aren't very nice, you know, just like some of you Californians aren't very nice. But anyway, uh, the way we are organized is we are a church here. I am not a hired employee, even though you do pay me so I can eat. <laughs> I developed this habit about a few years ago of wanting to eat on a regular basis. And so you do pay me, but I'm not hired. I'm self-employed and all of those kind of legal nonsense things, but I am not hired by this church. I was called here by this church. And the way we do that is, is that the church body, if they don't have a pastor, considers and talks to and prays with different pastors and has different pastors come in and preach, and then they say to them, we'd like you to come be our pastor. And then you have to make up your decision, your mind. Do you want to go there? Do you want to be their pastor or not? So back in the first Sunday in October in 1987, my wife and I and my four children, we came here and said, we will be your pastor and family. At that time, we joined the church. We became members of the First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park, even though I was pastor. And um, there is no hierarchy or no upper in the church. There's Jesus. The Bible says he's the shepherd of the church. And then the Bible says the church should have under shepherds. That is a shepherd under Jesus. Now, we are associated with other churches in Orange County, about 40 of them, like I said, and they do the same thing. And we have an office here in Orange County that's called the Orange County Southern Baptist Association. And we do have a little minimal staff there, a couple of ladies and one guy. And they run the office, and they uh, take care of business, okay? Okay. But they do, we do not answer to them. Every Southern Baptist church is what is called autonomous. That means they're individual, independent. We work and associate with them, the other 40 churches, but there's nobody over us except Jesus. And I'm of the opinion that's the way it ought to be. Now, there are other denominations, Baptists and otherwise, that have district area managers and bishops, and, and I'm not criticizing that, but it's just not the way the Bible says do it. And so we have an association of churches here in Orange County, and uh, probably in November we're going to invite, we're, we will, every year you have a meeting, you have a business meeting, 
to deal with the business of the association and to vote and so forth. And so we'll be inviting some of you to go to that business meeting, and I think it's in November, but I'll have to let you know later. That's the local association. Then there are all kind of associations all over the state. And then there's the state convention made up of those associations. And uh, when you have a meeting, every church, no matter how large it is, is allowed up to 10 representatives, or we call them messengers. No church can have more than 10. And uh, so that makes it very equal and democratic. And once a year, we come together as a state convention and vote on different issues and our budget. We plan out and schedule out based on the previous year, based on where we think God wants us to go. We discuss, everybody pitches in, and we discuss where we're going. Now, the money that comes into the state convention comes from the local churches. And then we have a national convention, which is the Southern Baptist Convention made up of every state. The State Convention of California, the California Southern Baptist Convention, met this week. And we had fellowship and preaching. We had the pastor's meeting and a lot of good stuff went on. We also had reports from our mission groups and from different organizations. And we also voted and elected a new president of the California Southern Baptist group and a vice president. And we also voted, discussed and voted on the budget for the new year. The budget for the new year we decided, people from all the state, the budget for the year is $10.8 million. It's a big budget. And we won't make it if all of our churches don't give a little bit. But the beauty of Southern Baptist is that every church can participate, even homeless churches, and even little tiny churches that only run how many we got tonight? 30? 20 something? All of us have equal votes and all of us have equal opportunity as well as obligation. The big churches give more, we give just a little. But it's all put into one pot. And we call that pot the cooperative program. We have a worldwide cooperative program that furnishes enough money from each state to take care of our national budget. And so when you give to this church, you're giving to the Southern Baptist Convention Cooperative Program. Now let me tell you what you get for your dollar, if you give a dollar or ten dollars or whatever you get. We have, right now, as we speak, a little over 10,000 missionaries on the field. Now, we don't send missionaries to the field and ask them to raise their own funds. When we send a man and his wife or a family or an individual, when we send them to the mission field all over the world, we pay all of their expenses. So our Southern Baptist Convention budget that you contribute to makes sure that those people, those 10,000 people, can do their work without worrying about paying the light bill or buying food. They're paid. And it's all based on the country they work in and where they're at. We don't pay big bucks, but we don't let people go hungry. We're very frugal about our payroll and all of those kind of things. And uh, we do have retirement for our missionaries and so forth. So we're a big, large organization, second only to the Roman Catholic organization. We're almost as big as they are. But the beauty of our bigness is our littleness. When you give to this church, you can not only put a buck in the 
bucket to fill the cross, but when you put your money in the offering plate, your regular offerings, those regular offerings, first of all, go to pay the light bill and the pastor and the water bill and the gas bill, and then we send a little bit to the cooperative program to help pay those missionaries. That's how we operate. Now, does anybody have any questions you'd like to ask at this time? Anything that's come up on your mind? Yes, sir. Good question. Answer to that question is yes, we can ask them to help us pay the light bill. They typically don't do that or won't do that, not because they don't like us, <laughs> but simply because they figure that the local church ought to be able to sustain itself and take care of its own bills. Uh, they do not do that very often. Sometimes they do, but Typically, they do not, but let me, that's sort of a negative answer, but let me give you the positive side of that. The Association of Orange County churches saw what we were doing, and every month, we get a little check from the associational office to help us with, the light, with anything we want to spend it on, groceries, lights, whatever. And they have voted as a group to support us with a monthly check. And every month we get a check from them. It's not a lot of money. Uh, I'll be glad to tell you what it is, but I don't want everybody going out of here and talking about how big it is or how little it is. The discussion, this is family discussion. And I don't want you out there discussing it because the devil will use it against us. They send us a check every month for $300. Now, that's not a lot of money, but it goes a long way. We make it go a long way. Sarong Community Church, even though they're not Southern Baptists, they're totally independent. From us, they send us a check every month. And I'm not going to tell you how much that is. It's not a big check. It's a small check. But I'm not at liberty because they're not Southern Baptists. And it's not a, none of your business and our business to talk about what other churches give us. Other people, I have friends. This church has friends uh, that periodically send a check to this church. We have a Baptist foundation in the state, and every once in a while, somebody leaves money to the foundation, and we'll get a check because they said we want to help feed the homeless, or help Wiley's church, or whatever. And so we get money from all kinds of avenues. But the bottom line is, on the giving basis, we obviously cannot give very much. We're small. But all of the smallness comes together and puts over 10,000 missionaries on the field. We also have six university and colleges and seminaries all over the country to train those missionaries, six of them, thousands of students in all of these schools. And that comes from the tuition that the students pay, but tuition that the students pay is very low because of the cooperative program. And so when you give money to this church, you're not only supporting your local church, but you're supporting seminaries and missionaries all around the world, and our main goal is to tell people about Jesus. All right, any other questions? That's a cooperative program. You'll hear me from time to time mention that. We have some special offerings during the year. At Christmas time, we have one called the Annie Armstrong offering. That's an offering that we take up where none of it is used for administration cost, it all goes to the mission field. And that's a special Christmas offering that we take up. 
and it was named after a lady by the name of Annie Armstrong. Annie Armstrong was a missionary to China, and uh, she was very, very dedicated. And so they named that offering after her. She's since died and gone to heaven a long time ago. But we have several offerings like that. There are special offerings we take up during the year that go into the cooperative program. And uh, it's a great, great opportunity. So anytime you give a little extra, we can give a little extra. And that's basically the way it boils down. All right, any other questions? Anybody have any questions? The pro Some people ask questions about the property. The property here is in the name of the church, First Southern Baptist Church of Buena Park. It's not in my name. It's in the church's name. This property cannot be sold without the approval of the pastor and the people. And we cannot make any kind of legal financial decision for the church without it being taken to the pastor and the church. Um, that's about it, I think, as far as organization is concerned. But anyway, once a year in uh, October, we have our annual meeting, and we go for two or three days and have a meeting, and that's where I was. We had our meeting. Uh, I got it off to a bad start with a car wreck. But other than that, the meeting went well. We had 100 students from one of our universities. California Baptist University is in Riverside. A hundred young women and men who are very, very talented choir and orchestra, and I mean top notch. You couldn't go to New York or Las Vegas or anywhere else and see anybody any more professional and any more uh, excellent than they are. So we are proud of our seminaries and our different uh, groups and organizations. We have a men's organization. We also have a disaster relief team. The disaster relief team is made up of people from all over the country. When an earthquake or flood hits, uh, you go with those, that disaster relief team. You have to have training. You have to be trained. It's trained through the Red Cross. We work very closely with the Red Cross. And at this annual convention, we set up one of our disaster tents. We have some big tents that we set up in the event of an earthquake or flood or fire. And uh, anytime you see Hurricane Katrina, or they, you see people with yellow caps and yellow shirts on, those are Southern Baptists. Those are the Southern Baptist disaster team. Men and women uh, that go and serve. Just see me and say, I'd like to get involved in the next training session. And we have training sessions all during the year. Uh, sometimes we've had one or two here. Yeah. They typically go in, set up a tent, and teach you how to prepare food, and teach you how to do CPR, and teach you how to, you know, so forth. Yeah. And so if you'd like to do that, just let me know if you're interested, and I'll find out when the next. Uh, Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Been there, done that, yeah. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll let you know when the next training session is, and uh, we'll, we'll, anybody that would like to go. It's typically a day and a night. Typically they'll have it like here and come in one day and have classes during the day and set up the tent and, and uh, show you how to cook, and I know you know how to cook, but you don't know how to cook the disaster relief way. It has to be done a special way. Anyway, and um, so anyway, I'll let you know. It's usually an all-day affair, and then you do it a part of a second day or sometimes a full second day, but I'll let you know if you're interested in getting involved. Um, any questions? All right, I want to share. We had the meeting, had to wreck, yada, yada. But uh, there was an absolute miracle at the meeting. And let me tell you about that miracle. As many of you know, uh, we are doing a lot to help people try to get their kids back. We're doing a lot to try to help people get out of trouble, 
get their life reestablished. When Will came here, he was a felon and couldn't vote. Okay? He's an ex-felon now, and now he can vote. He got his voting privileges back, and I'm not just picking on him, but that's a success story. And others have success stories. And so uh, that's what our goal is. And uh, we have been talking about on our TV show about an issue called the court of public opinion. As many of you know, sometimes when you go to court, you don't get a fair deal. You just don't get a fair deal. So we've been taking some things to the court of public appeal. We told you the story about what happened in New York, right, with Dr. Manning's church and the painting on the walls and all that kind of stuff. That was a case of us winning a court of public appeals. I'm going to tell you another story that happened about six years ago, and the reason I'm going to tell you this story is to tell you about a miracle that happened this week. About six years ago, I got a call from a Filipino pastor, and he said, Pastor Drake, we understand <clears throat> that you're active in helping people. And I said, yes, I am. Our church is. I am. So he said, we got a problem. They had started a small, about six or eight families, church in Long Beach. They were all Filipinos from the Philippines. Legal, but here from the Philippines. And they had a pastor. And I don't know if you've been around Filipinos much or not, uh, but, and I'm going to show my prejudice. They are music people. <laughs> They love to sing, and they love to dance, and they love Jesus. And so that's just the way the Filipinos work. Anyway, they started a church over in Long Beach in the probably uh, the biggest, one of the biggest ghettos over there, except it was a barrio, graffiti everywhere, uh, gang bangers, gang fights, you know, <laughs> territorial, turfledom. And the pastor, who was about my age, and his wife and their singers, went over there, and they found this building. They, they raised some money, and they found this building that they thought they might afford. And the reason they found it and where they got it was because it, nobody else wanted it. The windows were all broken out of it. It had graffiti all over it. Homeless people were sleeping in it and messing it up. The building was in terrible shape. And... Uh, the real estate people that had it listed didn't even know <laughs> whether it was listed or not. And so the pastor went over with his men and the women and said, we won't buy that building. And so he said, are you sure? And they said, yeah, we won't buy that building. So they found out what they were going to ask for the building. And it wasn't very much because nobody else was trying to buy it. Nobody else wanted it. It was, a blight. it was in the blighted, officially in the blight area of the city of Buena Park. So designated, blight. <laughs> Nobody had been in a building for years. They bought the building, raised enough money to buy the building. They bought the building and uh, began to work on the building. Began to take out the broken windows and put in some good windows. I began to take the graffiti off the outside and clean it up on the inside, chased all the homeless people out uh, unless they would stay there with them and sleep there, and some of them came over here. But they went in and cleaned the building up and started having church. And when they have church, they have church. The preacher preaches about 30 minutes, but they sing and preach for about two or three hours. And the gangs in the area were younger gang members, beboppers, hip-hoppers, rap, etc. Well, the Filipinos said, hey, we like that rap. We want to learn how to rap. And so they started working with the Filipinos and brought them in to sing and rap and bebop and hip-hop and all that kind of stuff. And they invited them to come to church. And, of course, they went... Oh, no, we're not coming to that church. They all came out of Catholic background. 
And so they said, well, we're Baptists, but you're welcome. So when they did their services, they wouldn't come into church. So they did a couple of things out in the parking lot, and then the weather got bad, and the pastor said, listen, I'm not going to beg them people to come to church. I'm not going to, we're not going outside. We got our church cleaned up now. The heaters work. It's dry. The graffiti has been covered over. If they want to come to church, they can come into church. And they wouldn't come. So the pastor said, okay, we're going to have our services, but we're going to open all the windows. And so they opened all the windows and had church, and the, Philip, and the uh, gangbangers would hang around outside and dance and holler and have a ball and worship with them. And so the gangbangers would come outside, and the Filipinos would be inside. And some of the young Filipinos went out there and said, show me how you do that, you know, rap stuff and all that kind of And so they went out to them, and finally a couple of the gangbangers said, well, those guys aren't bad. They're pretty nice. They're not bad people. And so they started coming into church. And before long, the church was not one-third filled with Filipinos, but it was filled with two-thirds Mexican, African-American, and Asian gangbangers. They had an Asian gang, a Hispanic gang. They had bloods and crypts and dips and daps and everything. And they all started coming into church. And some of them got saved and met Jesus, got their life turned around and started working at the church and started telling other people about Jesus and told people, you better not put graffiti on that church. We'll take you, we'll take care of you. And they said, by the way, one of the guys came in there. One of the Filipino fellows said, look, I got tattoos on my arms and everywhere. And I can't take them off. But we can take the graffiti off the city. So they went out of the church and went into the streets and cleaned up all the graffiti. And began to tell people. They said, well, why are you coming over here to clean up our graffiti? Because Jesus loves you. And so they began to clean up all the graffiti in that part of town. And the city loved it. And the whole town there was transformed now into a church community of Filipinos and ex-gang people, ex-prostitutes, no more prostitutes on the street, no more pimps on the street, no more gang fights on the street, Everything started happening great, and they converted the city. Now, a developer came along and said, hey, now that y'all got that cleaned up, we're interested in that property. They had been interested in the property before it was a church. And they said, we want to come in here and build a hotel. The town's cleaned up. We want to put a nice hotel in here. And so we want that property. And the city said, well, it's not ours. We sold it to the church. It belongs to the church. You'll have to go see the church. So they went over and met with the pastor. And the pastor said, we don't want to sell the church. God's blessing us. We're telling people about Jesus. So the pastor called me and said, Pastor, they offered to buy the church for double what we paid for it. What should I do? I said, tell them whatever Jesus tells you to do. If Jesus says sell it, sell it and run with the money. (laughs) But don't do it unless Jesus tells you to. So they had a meeting. And as good Baptists, they discussed it for a long time. And finally the pastor said, okay, we've talked about this. We've discussed it. Somebody make a motion on what to do. Do we sell the church and try to find another one somewhere? We only paid about, I think they paid like $150,000 for the building. They had offered them $350,000 for it. Should we, you know, and um, they discussed it. The pastor said, okay, now it's time to vote. Anybody want to make a motion? And somebody stood up and said, I'd like to make a motion, pastor. I'd like to make a motion that we send a letter to the company that offered to buy it and tell them thanks but no thanks. We don't want to sell. 
And so they sent a letter and said, thanks for your generous offer, but no thanks. And so the developers went to the city and said, you got to do something. Those people, we offered them three times what they paid for that property. We want that property. We're going to put this multi-million dollar big hotel in here, and you're going to make a lot of tax money. We want that building. And the city said, we can't do anything. So they increased the price to the church, and the pastor called me and said, what do I do? I said, same thing you did last time. Ask Jesus what to do, and he'll tell you. So they sent him another letter and said, thanks, but no thanks. And then they went to the city and put pressure on the city, and the city said, okay, this is in a blight area. We're going to declare eminent domain on that church building, and we're going to take it away from the church and give it to the corporation. And that's when the pastor called me and said, what do we do? I said, we take it before the court of public opinion. So I got in my car, and I drove to Long Beach and paid high-priced parking and went to the city council meeting and said, I don't know what you guys are doing or planning on doing, but whatever it is, you better check with God first. And, of course, they who are you and what are you doing here and get out of here and yada, yada, yada. And I said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take the court of public opinion. And everybody around Long Beach said, hey, we think that ought to remain a church. Look what good work they've done. Look how everything's worked out so well. And we think it ought to stay. We don't think you ought to do eminent domain. And the city fathers said, well, we're going to take a vote. And they voted to do eminent domain and take the property away from the church. I went over there at that next meeting where they were going to have to take the vote and said, ladies and gentlemen, my name's Wiley Drake, and I'm live on Crusade Radio right now. We're going to put Long Beach on a worldwide map. We, as First Southern Baptist Church and the pastor of the First Southern Baptist Church or Southern Baptist brothers and sisters of these folks are going to declare tonight Long Beach as the most unfriendly city in America toward churches. And I'm live on the air. And so they said, well, we got to table this. And so they tabled it to the next meeting. We went over there to the meeting. And, of course, the news media was there and all that. And an attorney was there to help. And uh, news media was saying, okay, what are you going to do? And the mayor and the city council asked me to meet privately, and I said, no. You meet with me and the Filipino pastor, but you're not meeting with me privately. I got nothing to say to you. I'm going to do what I said I was going to do if you guys continue to do this. And so they tried to talk me out. They tried to threaten me that they were going to sue me. They were going to put me in jail and so forth and so on. And I said, be my guest. I always wanted a jail ministry. And uh, so finally, the city met with the attorney, and the attorney said uh, to me, Pastor Drake, I, I don't, you know, they can do this. They've got eminent domain. They can declare eminent domain. Any city can in a blighted area. They've already voted and designated it as blighted area. So we don't have a very good case. Well, Crazy O'Wiley Wiley went to D.C., and I found a new law that had been written in 2000 called RELUPA, and it is to protect religious organizations from eminent domain. And I found out that there was a law on the books, a federal law on the books, that would supersede anything Long Beach would do. And so I went back to the city council meeting and said, do it. We'll suit the socks off, and I always wanted to own Long Beach. <laughs> and have a church in Long Beach with my name on it. And so you go for it. In fact, the lady that was the mayor pro tem was a black lady. And she had gotten in my face a time or two, and I said, Lady, I always wanted to own Long Beach. And I said, 
you go, girl. <laughs> and so we had a meeting, and they said, we have decided that we don't want the bad press and that the court of public opinion is killing us. Our phones are ringing. We can't do any business. Because I got on the radio and television and said, call these numbers. I gave the numbers for all the city council people and their home numbers and their cell phone numbers. and We burned their phones up. And they said, okay, what do we do? And I said, leave them alone. And there was a, an attorney there that came over and said, Pastor, I'm here to help, but I don't know what I can do. I said, hey, you're the attorney. I'm just an old stupid preacher. He said, now tell me about that law you found out about. And so he went home and researched for two days and came back and said, okay. The city has agreed to leave eminent domain go. And him being an attorney said, uh, that's good. Why do you've won? But he said, as your attorney... <laughs> I think we ought to make them give us something in writing. Not just say they'll not do it, because if they say they won't do it now, a month from now, six months from now, they can decide to do it. So he had them draw up a legal document that said you cannot declare eminent domain in violation of a federal law, and you cannot take this church, and we will not attempt to take this church and put it in writing, and I want every name on there, and I went to the you go, girl, and I said, I want your name at the top of the list when you sign it. And so they signed it, and the church is still there. That's a victory, and I'm not telling you that victory to tell you what a great guy I am. God just used it, and it was a victory for Jesus and the good guys. I happen to be one of the good guys. Well, recently, we've been fighting some of these cases that are absolutely very difficult, I don't know who that is, I'll call later, very difficult to deal with some of these family cases. And I've tried to work with several attorneys, and um, I couldn't find any that would really do anything for us. They kept saying, well, it's Child Protective Services, and they're all, after all, they're doing what's best for the kids. And so, on. And so I, I asked God, God, bring an attorney to us. And about three weeks ago, I remembered this attorney that was there that drew up the paperwork that helped us in Long Beach. And I could see him as clear as I could see myself in the mirror, but I couldn't remember his name. And I said, Lord, first of all, please forgive me for being so sloppy and losing the business card that he gave me. And I scratched around in my car and in my desk, and I never could find it. I asked several of y'all to pray, and you agreed to. Asked people on the radio and television to pray, and they agreed to. That I would either find that card or we would be able to cross paths. I had no idea where he was from. I knew he was from somewhere around here, but I knew it wasn't right here. It was somewhere else. I couldn't remember his name. Couldn't remember, could remember his face like it was yesterday. That was about six years ago. And so after I had my wreck <laughs> over there, I set up my little... TV station and got ready to televise, and a pastor came over and said, hey, Pastor Wiley, how are you, brother? guy in Moreno Valley that knows me, and uh, he said, uh, you're going to do your show, and can I come over and be on your show? I said, yeah, come on over. He said, no, I was only kidding. I don't want to be on the show. He pastors in Moreno Valley, and about that time, a guy come walking up, and I spotted him, and I knew who it was. That pastor grabbed him by the hand and said, hello, brother. Bill, how are you? Come over here. I want you to meet my buddy, Wiley Drake. And he said, oh, I know Wiley Drake. Wiley Drake taught me as a lawyer how to fight Ralupa. He said, I've never been put into so much study at home since I went to law school. That preacher's a good lawyer. And I said, oh, don't accuse me of being a lawyer. Please don't accuse me. He said, well... You caused me to have to do a lot of homework and a lot of research, but we won that case. And it wasn't because of me. It was because of you. And I said, well, by the way, brother, I'm sure glad I got to see you again. Give me your business card, and I'm not going to lose it. <laughs> and uh, I need a good attorney. 
and I've been looking for you and couldn't find you. He said, well, you found me now. His web page, listen to his web page. Lawyers who fight dot com. Lawyers who fight dot com. I want you to pray for that organization and I want you to pray for Bill Kennedy. William C. Kennedy. His office is in Riverside. On his business card it says um, Hablamos Espanol. And Bill is an old Irish boy like me and um, doesn't speak any Spanish except maybe burrito and taco <laughs> and maybe even chimichanga. I don't know, but anyway. <laughs> and, uh, but his partner is Jimenez. So I think that's where the Spanish comes from. So God performed a miracle. Bill is a Southern Baptist, and he was just there at the meeting. He just came to the meeting for a few hours to hear some of the preaching. He came to the preacher's conference, and he said, I'm sure glad. He said, I wasn't going to come. He said, I live in Riverside a long way up there. And he said, I live in Riverside, and he said, I didn't want to come, but my wife told me I ought to go. And I said, no, it wasn't your wife. That was the Lord. And uh, he said, I sure am glad I came. I sure am glad. to." He said, I often wondered whatever happened to you. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that just goes to show you how God will perform a miracle if we'll ask him to. If we'll just ask him to. He says, ask me and I'll give you a miracle. Now, tonight, before we leave here, I'm going to share with you some scripture, and then we're going to ask God to perform some miracles. In the book of James, it says to you and to me, is there any among you that are sick? Let them pray. Is any merry? That means happy. Is any happy? Let him sing the Psalms like I do sometimes, off key, but I still sing them. Is any sick among you? Let him or her call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. Now, he goes on with some instructions, though, for anointing with oil and praying for the sick. He says, confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. It said Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth for the space of three years. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. Let him know that he which converteth a sinner from death shall hide a multitude of sins. So the Bible says, is there any sick among you? Let them or him call for the elders of the church. Anoint them with oil. Pray for them and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now the instructions are very clear. We are not to go to the Lord in prayer unless we've confessed all of our sins to him. I am not to even participate in an anointing service unless I confess my sins to the Lord. So I would ask each of you here to bow your heads. I'm going to pray out loud, but I want you to pray silently. 
And you can pray the same words I pray or different or however, but I want you to pray and confess your sins to the Lord silently. Father, I confess to you I have committed sins and I have omitted things that I should have done that I didn't do. And I've done things that I should not have done. But you say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if you're here tonight and you've confessed your sin, you are clean before the Lord. I don't care what you've done. You're absolutely clean before the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, Brenda mentioned to me earlier tonight that we hadn't done this in a while and that there were some sick folk here and that she felt it would be appropriate. And so she has called for the elder of the church to anoint with oil and pray over the sick. So... I happen to have some olive oil here. I want to ask all of you to stand. And if you would like to be anointed, I want to ask in just a few moments to just walk out down the aisle, walk up here, I'll anoint you with oil, and then go back and be seated, and we'll have one prayer for everybody. So if you'd like to be anointed with oil, please come forward. And I anoint you in the name of the Father and the Son. that we're to use oil, olive oil. Doesn't say it has to have garlic in it, but this does. Yeah, that's what it does. It's for the vampires. Yeah, that's to keep the vampires away. <laughs> but seriously, the oil always represents the Holy Spirit, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit of God. There's nothing magic about this oil. What happens is God honors our obedience. We started off that way. And uh, God didn't say use something else. He said use oil. I don't have time tonight, but you could go into a study of how oil is processed and what happens to it and so forth. And it's very simple uh, in the scripture about how it is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So as you remember tonight, say to the Lord Jesus, Father, I receive your healing. And I want all of you here to say it. You say it out loud or silently. I don't care. But I want you to say that you're receiving healing for whatever your problem is. You can say it silently if you want to do that. But say, Dear Father, Dear Father 
I receive this oil, and I claim your healing for, and then fill in the blank. Father, you have heard these prayers. I have been obedient as I know how to be as their pastor. I pray for healing that you said when you went to the cross, your blood and your stripes paid for our healing. And so, Lord, the healing has already been done. We claim it tonight for each of those that receive the oil and receive the prayer. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I want to ask our ushers to come forward. We do need to take our offering for the evening, give you an opportunity to give. Remember that the blue box is for the cross project. The offering plates are for our offering here at the church and for the Southern Baptist Cooperative Program. May God bless you as you give. We're going to do two things now. We're going to have the blessing on the offering. I'm going to give you some instructions, and then we're going to dismiss. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless this offering and ask you to use it. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. And now the instructions is, as soon as we stand, would you please stand? We're going to dismiss in just a moment and reconvene at a birthday party. And that birthday party is in the fellowship hall. Most of you know the birthday boy already, but if you don't, you'll find out when you get over there. We're going to go over and uh, sing happy birthday, God bless you, and have a birthday party. So let's do that after we have our benediction. Father, we come before you for William Ruffin. And we ask that you would bless this his birthday and give him many, many more. Bless this offering, bless our time together, bless the healing that went on here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, see you in Fellowship Hall.